Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all for this event. Uh, and for me, it's a particular pleasure. Um, uh, there are people on this podium who've been great friends uh, and people whose advice I've listened to on issues for a long period of time. You know, Strobe Talbot from Brookings, former senior official, former author. I guess you're always an author when you've been an author, but uh, I've been reading Strobe on things Soviet and things Russian forever and had great respect for uh, his leadership at Brookings, uh, and uh, great to have you here. Steve Pfeiffer, who uh, also has uh, got a, a wonderful career in US government and over at Brookings as well. Uh, terrific to have you here as well. Uh, Jan Lodel, my predecessor in my job here as president at the Atlantic Council, my mentor on many issues to do with the uh, running of the Atlantic Council, so great to have you here. And then, and then John Herbst, um, who we were able to lure to the Atlantic Council once we saw that Ukraine was going in the sad direction it was going uh, and, uh, and who has really led our Ukraine and Europe initiative and our Patricia Eurasia Center. So it's just a pleasure not only to have this strong of a group of people here, but um, when issues get tough and when moments become uh, of historic importance, I think it's almost required of organizations in Washington to work and collaborate more closely with each other to make clear that the importance of the situation and the fact that, uh, that we're in general agreement that something uh, more serious has to be done about it. Um, a year ago, the Atlantic Council recognized the gravity of the situation in Ukraine and first under the leadership of our Executive Vice President Damon Wilson organized our Ukraine and Europe initiative. Uh, this initiative is aimed at defending the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine as it moves toward an open society at home and European-oriented policy abroad. Uh, today, as Kremlin aggression in Ukraine is further undermining peace and security in Europe, we could not m be more proud of this latest initiative and its vital mission. Uh, Ukraine faces two main challenges, many challenges, but two primary ones. Uh, withstanding Mr. Putin's increasingly open and aggressive intervention and battling corruption and enacting meaningful reform. We're gathered to discuss how the international can, uh, community can help the people uh, of Ukraine address these challenges. Uh, this report that you see before you is a product of collaboration uh, of our uh, three institutions, but then other individuals as well. Uh, I've already introduced um, John Herbst, uh, the former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, uh, Jan Lodel, the former First Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Strobe, uh, the former Deputy Secretary of State, and another former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Steve Pfeiffer. Uh, some of the co-authors were not able to join us today. Uh, former Undersecretary of Defense, Michelle Flournoy, former, former NATO Supreme Allied Commander, Jim Stavridis, um, uh, General Chuck Wald, uh, the former Deputy Commander, European Command, and former U.S. Ambassador to NATO, Evo Dalder. It's an impressive and a varied group, and you can uh, imagine that this group does not necessarily agree on all things at all times, so I think the fact that they've come together around this paper says quite a bit. So uh, just to get us started, I, w I wondered if Strobe could say a few words, uh, make, give his comments of why he's decided to be involved in this initiative and how he's viewing the situation in general, having watched uh, the Soviet Union, and then the Russia for so many years, and then Jan Lodl. And then after that, I'll have John and Steve uh, brief, um, uh, uh, brief the report, and then we'll have an open discussion. I'll pose a few questions. I know Strobe may have to leave uh, a little bit uh, early in this uh, event, uh, which please feel free to do when you need to leave, but we'll have a good discussion of the report and its, uh, and its importance. Strobe. Thanks, Fred, and thank you for your leadership and the Council's leadership on this initiative and many other things. I would just uh, underscore one point. There is a common expression in the Russian language, call things by their own name. And in the context of what is happening in Ukraine today, the right way to characterize it is an act of war on the part of the Russian Federation. This means that there is going on in Ukraine today a literal invasion, not 
by, it's not a proxy war. It's a little, literal invasion by the Russian armed forces. It's a literal occupation of large parts well beyond Crimea of eastern Ukraine, and it is a virtual annexation of a lot of territory other than just the Crimea. And in that respect, this is a major threat to the peace of Europe, to the peace of Eurasia, and therefore a threat to the interests of the United States, and I would say a threat to the chances of a peaceful 21st century. Jan? Uh, I agree completely with what Strobe said. Uh, I like to think of it as a threat to world order. Uh, my former mentor and boss, Henry Kissinger, has just written a book on this subject, and he talks about the difficulty of finding a way to uh, uh, structure a world order in this epoch. Uh, we tried to do that after World War II based on some very old principles. And we added some tough new principles, one of which uh, was the inviolability of borders. This was demanded more than anyone else, by more than anyone else, the uh, Soviet Union, the predecessor to Russia. Uh, they had moved the border somewhat. Americans weren't so happy about that at the end of the war, but we went along with it in the Conference on the Security and Cooperation in Europe. And this is the first violation of this. Russia has not only violated uh, this uh, rule of international law, but many others as well. So that then leads to the question of what kind of approach can you take in these circumstances? Uh, our view was that an approach of purely uh, non-lethal military assistance, along with sanctions, wasn't quite adequate after Putin had continued his thrusts and invasions, it became clear that we needed to up our military deterrence. And it were those uh, considerations that formed uh, the backdrop for our effort. Um, Strobe, while we have you here, let me ask you a, a follow-up. And I uh, forgive the briefers of the report for me to do that. But I, I think since we have the benefit of, of, of your wisdom here, I'd like to have you take a look at, you've been following the foreign policy, of Moscow, the Kremlin for many years. What lies behind this? You know, what is, how would you assess the, uh, the Kremlin's foreign policy path? Um, what is the end game? Uh, and then what is your answer to what will be the uh, dominant criticism of this report and the reason why defensive weapons haven't gone so far or any weapons have gone so far from the West? And that is up the escalatory ladder uh, Putin will always be willing to go a little bit further than we are. Well, on the first point, what is in the thinking of the president of the Russian Federation, he's told us. If you parse what he has said, particularly over the last year, but with hints of it before that, he regards the dissolution of the Soviet Union as the great strategic geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And he is, to the extent possible, going to try to reverse that. Now, he's not going to reverse it necessarily by recreating something called the USSR. But he is implementing what has, I think, always been a kind of fatal flaw, including for Russia's own interests over the centuries. And that is to define its own security in a way that makes all of its neighbors, and I believe there are now 14 of its neighbors, feel uh, insecure. That, I think, is what, is he is what he is up to. He is also, and this is a kind of biologic, bi bi biographical, maybe biological too, a biographical irony in that he is reversing the legacy of Boris Yeltsin. Had it not been for Boris Yeltsin picking Vladimir Putin out of obscurity and making him his successor, we would not have ever heard of uh, Vladimir Putin. But uh, we would also very likely still have something that deserves the name, speaking of calling things by their own name, a commonwealth of independent states. Ukraine is being treated by Russia 
certainly not as a member of a commonwealth, not as an independent country, and not as a sovereign uh, state. I think the answer to the criticism or the caveat that uh, you alluded to, Fred, is yes, there is, and we all have to recognize it, a danger of some degree of escalation here. But Putin seems to be bent on escalation. His overall strategy is essentially a double game. Talk across the table and kill on the ground uh, in Ukraine. And by the way, as a result, a lot of Russians are being killed. So the counter to that legitimate caveat is that for the West, led by the United States, not to up the ante in the deadly game that Putin is playing is to invite Putin to continue to believe, which I think he does believe, that the West is soft, that the West is not going to stand up to him, and he'll just keep rolling, and not just in Ukraine. Um, uh, you know, I don't mean to escalate myself, but uh, but at the uh, at troops on the ground at some point. I mean, do, do the defensive weapons really? If this is an active war, if this is not a proxy war, I think your statement uh, is a very strong one, and 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 I thank you for that, of of calling things what they are. If there is a major threat to peace in Europe uh, and beyond, uh, doesn't it call for perhaps even more than this? Well, it, what more means uh, is, of course, ought, ought to be an open question that is constantly looked at. I am not advocating, and I don't, uh, I'm, and uh, the report certainly doesn't advocate uh, U.S. troops or NATO troops uh, on the ground uh, in Ukraine. I do think, however, to just take advantage of an opportunity to call into everybody's attention the importance of the Baltic states uh, in particular. The Baltic states are members, are, are allies in NATO. I'm not sure that Vladimir Putin totally accepts that as an operating uh, principle. He is uh, unquestionably probing, uh, particularly in Estonia and uh, Latvia, uh, little green men and more. Uh, and I think it is important to have real boots, uh, including American boots and our European allies' boots on the ground in the Baltic states. Thank you for that clear answer. Uh, so, so John, Steve, maybe you can uh, brief us uh, uh, on the report. All right. Uh, I think Fred asked a good question at the beginning when he said, you know, what prompted eight people of very different views to get together so quickly on one issue? And it was quick. Um, Jan proposed this idea just six and a half weeks ago. And within three weeks of his proposing the idea, we were in Brussels. And within six weeks, we had a finished report, which you have in front of you. And the answer to that question is very simple. Um, the revision of, revisionism of the Russian president is the greatest national security danger facing the planet today. And this revisionism, he's made clear both in words and in deeds. He claims the right to protect ethnic Russians wherever they may be. He claims the right to have a sphere of influence, 19th century style, in the space of the former Soviet Union. He claims that if the rules of the post-Cold War world are not rewritten, there will be no rules. And to demonstrate that he means it, he partly dismantled Georgia, and he's now gone to work on Ukraine. And to make it clear that his ambitions go beyond Ukraine, as Strobe said, Mr. Putin, on the day that the NATO summit ended, kidnapped an Estonian official from Estonia. And a few weeks later, just in case the Balts did not get the message that they are not secure, he seized a ship in international waters in the Baltic Sea, a Lithuanian ship. Those measures more than made up for the decisions taken at Wales meant to reassure our Baltic allies that we've got their backs. So it was this that drove the eight of us together and sent us to Brussels and then to, and then to Ukraine. In Brussels, as you can look, if you look at the report, you'll see the annex we met with the Secretary General Stoltenberg, his deputy Sandy Vershbo, General Breedlove, and all of his senior staff as well as Doug Lute, our ambassador to NATO, and a host of other perm reps. So we had an extensive set of briefings. And we learned some things there that, again, are in the report, but just to put them out there for you. According to our information, anywhere from 250 to 1,000 Russian military officers are in Ukraine, where they are in got, in, engaged in making sure that the quote unquote separatists are well prepared to continue their offensive in the country.
uh, to make this easier, over, since early December, hundreds of pieces of heavy equipment have rolled from Russia into Ukraine, tanks, armored personnel carriers, missiles. And the Russian advisors have been working on strengthening command and control. This is not a matter of, quote unquote, Ukrainians rebelling against their government. This is an effort that, has been, that was organized, financed, led, and in many cases staffed by um, citizens of the Russian Federation. And there should be no confusion about that. And I'll turn it over to Steve at this point. OK, well, uh, after uh, Brussels, we went on to Ukraine, where we had meetings both in Kyiv and also in Kramatorsk, the front headquarters in northwest Donetsk. And we probably had about 20 meetings with senior Ukrainian military and civilian officials. Uh, I guess the one difference we did here between Brussels and Ukraine is the number of Russian troops uh, that the Ukrainians say are in uh, eastern Ukraine is, is significantly higher than the NATO estimate. But we, can't, we did have the opportunity to get a very full picture of the situation in eastern Ukraine and a very clear picture of what the Ukrainian military needs. Uh, and we concluded that it's time uh, for the US government to provide serious resources to assist the Ukrainian military. Uh, the specific recommendation is for $1 billion in FY 2015, followed by $1 billion each in two th FY 2016 and fiscal year 2017. And we think it's important to get this money going and this assistance going as soon as possible. Uh, we also recommend that the US government consider drawing stocks out of US defense stocks to get it on the ground, uh, in particular because there is a concern that when spring arrives in Ukraine, April or May, you may see a significant uptick in the fighting, uh, and uh, therefore time is of the essence. Now, we had extensive uh, conversations both in Kyiv and also in Kramatorsk at the headquarters on what the Ukrainian military needs. And most of the assistance funds that we're talking about would go to non-lethal assistance. Uh, perhaps the biggest requirement that we heard from the Ukrainians was for counter-battery radar that would allow them to pinpoint the origin of artillery and multiple launch rocket strikes out to 30 to 40 kilometers. Uh, one Ukrainian colonel told us that about 70% of their casualties are called by rocket and artillery attacks. A second requirement is for a medium altitude, medium range uh, unmanned aerial vehicles or drones, which the Ukrainians could use to increase their tactical awareness and also designed to uh, fix where artillery and enemy rocket sites are. A third requirement is for electronic countermeasures to disrupt opposition drones, uh, which are being used extensively by the Russians and the separatists. And then the other non-lethal requirements were for secure communications, armored Humvees, and medical support equipment. We did make a recommendation also that the US government change its policy, which currently provides only for non-lethal assistance to provide for defensive lethal assistance. And the, and the biggest uh, Ukrainian requirement in that area is for light anti-armor weapons. Uh, the Ukrainian stockpile of such weapons uh, is at least 20 years old. Uh, we were told about three quarters of those weapons simply do not work. And both in NATO and in Ukraine, we heard that they've seen a strong flow of Russian armor, tanks and armored personnel carriers from Russia into eastern Ukraine. I think one comment we heard at NATO was, and they're not even really bothering to do much to try to hide it anymore. Uh, finally, we propose that the US government engage with other NATO allies to see if they would be prepared to provide both uh, lethal and non-lethal assistance. And of particular use to Ukraine would be equipment from Central European allies who have former Soviet hardware that's compatible with what the Ukrainians now use. Now, uh, I think some fear, and we've, I think, uh, Fred, you asked that question, is this going to lead the Russians to escalate? And our view was actually, as you've heard, no, the Russians have already escalated a lot over the last 10 months. And the goal here is to give the Ukrainians military assistance so that they can raise the cost of escalation, the cost of aggression to Russia. And it's not about giving the Ukrainian army enough to beat the Russian army. That's not going to happen. But if the Ukrainian army can raise the costs of aggression, uh, it may be able to change that calculation in Moscow. It may be able to deter the Russians from further action. So the object here is to remove the military option, or at least remove the inexpensive military option from Moscow's toolkit. If the Ukrainians can do that with Western assistance, and that you have Western sanctions continue on Russia, we think that there's a very good chance that Moscow will then look for another way, and that would be the path of negotiating a, a genuine settlement, which the Russians so far have not really pursued. And I would just close by coming back to a point that Strobe made. This is a question not only of, uh, of uh, responding to Ukraine's needs, 
but it's also a question of uh, pushing back against Russia's challenge to the broader European security order. And if we don't take action now, there is a serious risk of further Russian incursions, further Russian attempts to redraw borders, and they may take place in places that we can't ignore. And the cost then to the United States of pushing back will be much more expensive than what we're advocating today. See, thank, thanks very much for that, uh, uh, that, that clear description of the most important points of the report and what's behind your arguments. Uh, Jan is the person who was really uh, pushing for this group to come together. Uh, maybe you can uh, brief us a little bit on what you hope the outcome of this sort of report could be. We read in the uh, New York Times this morning uh, from Michael Gordon, Eric Schmidt, uh, commenting uh, in, in part on this report uh, <clears throat> that though uh, President Obama has made no decisions on lethal assistance, that after a, a series of striking reversals that Ukraine's forces have suffered, the Ob Obama administration is taking a fresh look at the question of military aid. Uh, Secretary of State Kerry planning to visit Kiev and on Thursday. The, uh, there's a report here in the New York Times that he's open to discussions of providing lethal assistance. And also uh, the New York Times, uh, Michael Gordon uh, reporting that uh, uh, General Dempsey is also in that position, and that uh, as is outgoing uh, Defense Secretary uh, Chuck Hagel. So, A, uh, I don't know whether you want to uh, comment at all on the fact that there's some movement in the administration, but maybe uh, uh, what you can speak on is what impact you hope this report will have. Well, I think we all hope that uh, the recommendations will be accepted. That's the uh, first straightforward thing, and that. Uh, uh, quick movement uh, takes place in that regard. Obviously, experts will have to look at the details of how to put together these packages of assistance. We suggested capabilities. We tried not to get into specific kinds of uh, uh, packages and, and weapon systems and exactly how to get them. We suggested a path that we thought was feasible, and we'd like to see that accepted. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of people inside the government and outside the government have seen this coming. Uh, we did not see this recent offensive coming. Uh, we got back and had our report pretty much finished before this latest offensive took place. Uh, and it's a pretty significant offensive. Uh, they're likely to be able to cut off a salient that the, uh, 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 that the Ukrainian uh, army has maintained and perhaps trap some significant numbers of Ukrainian forces and they've opened up another rail yard. And so there's a lot of military action happening right now uh, that's not good. Obviously, this kind of aid isn't going to get there soon enough to handle this battle. But uh, uh, we would like to see, number one, an acceptance of the view that old-fashioned Clausewitzian de deterrence has to be put in place here, uh, that nothing short of actual deterrence in the form of a military capability that, as my colleagues have said, raises the cost to the point where it's not worth it for the other side to undertake an attack and, uh, and, and to implement something along the lines of what we suggested. And I'll emphasize that everything we suggested is defensive. We haven't suggested any offensive arms here. Uh, we don't think the Ukrainians particularly want them. They don't need them. They don't have any uh, offensive uh, objectives here. Uh, but they do want to be able to defend their, defend their territory. Um, in terms of the broader political goals we, uh, we have, I'd turn to my colleagues. I don't know, Strobe, do you want to add something to that? Well, the political goals and the economic goals are, of course, uh, very uh, much connected with each other. And uh, we have two former ambassadors to Kiev here who should follow up on this. But it is essential, I think, that uh, while uh, Ukraine is indisputably, uh, nakedly a victim uh, of a villainous act on the part of its large neighbor, uh, Ukraine has lots that it has to do internally in order to finally get on the road to a modern economy, do something about uh, a corruption, uh, and have in place the, culture, the political culture and the economic culture of a modern state if Russia will allow it to be one. The, uh, let, let me open up to all of you on that, because the, uh, having just returned from the World Economic Forum, I think that a lot of business leaders there were quite impressed by the economic team that, uh, that Ukraine has put together. In fact, many who'd been dealing with Ukraine for many years thought it was the best economic team they've ever uh, had together. How do these issues work together? Uh, you're in the middle of a crisis and in the middle of an aggression. 
you've got uh, economic reformers at work, and the same time you have to you have to protect your country. Um, uh, so, uh, as you're thinking through this uh, set of recommendations, how does it fit together with the economic side and the other elements of, of sort of a comprehensive strategy? Maybe take a crack. I mean, actually, I think there are kind of four pieces here to that strategy that, that fit together uh, quite well and, and complement one another. One part of this is financial assistance to Ukraine, uh, provided that Ukraine is really moving on reform to help Ukraine do those reforms and get its economy to a better place. That's part number one. Part number two has been put in place by the United States and the European Union now, going back eight, nine months. These are financial and economic sanctions on Russia that are designed to encourage the Russians to change course. The third piece, I think, is this kind of military assistance where you want to get the Ukrainians to the point where they can basically close off that military option, where the Russians understand that continued attacks around Albetsevo or the places that have been going on the last couple of weeks have real costs. And if you can get the Russians to conclude that those costs are too much, then that points to the fourth piece, which is the actually getting them into a negotiation, where the Russians are prepared to deal in a way that takes serious account of Ukrainian concerns. So I, I think these pieces all fit together in that way. And the, and the sanctions and the military assistance are designed to steer Moscow away from its current course towards the diplomatic off-ramp that the administration has talked about for some time, but the Russians have not yet been prepared to take. Can, can we conclude, quick follow-up, can we conclude that uh, because of what we're seeing happening on the ground that the uh, economic sanctions have failed as a military deterrent? Mm -hmm. I, 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 w I think that that would be a mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was predictable that when the economic sanctions first were applied, that President Putin would say, we've got to pull together, we've got to show the West we're not going to let them interfere with our sovereignty. Mm. Uh, and that can work in the short term. The question in my mind is if the West can maintain the discipline on the sanctions, maintain sanctions, increase them as appropriate, uh, how is the Russian population going to be thinking about this six or eight months down the road? So I think we're, basically, we're playing a mid to long term game here in terms of the impact of the sanctions. And if the Kremlin begins to see public support erode, that may be the key to getting them to adopt a different course. And same time, fall of oil prices, same yeah. time, fall of the ruble, et cetera, et cetera. But, but there, please, there are John. two points that you need to add to Steve's no. wonderful list. The first, regarding sanctions policy. Um, first of all, during the first seven or eight months of this crisis, Putin was trying to calibrate his aggression to avoid sanctions. Ultimately, he decided his objectives in Ukraine were worth taking sanctions, so he, he did that. But he's now hoping and not just hoping, working to persuade Europe to lift the sanctions before, when, when the sectoral sanctions, which are the most punishing sanctions, are up for renewal in September. And so if he could achieve his aggressive designs now and then let things quiet down, he would, would hope that the sanctions will come off in September. So a critical objective for us is to be, maintain the sanctions to help the EU decide to renew them in September. Because then, with the maintenance of low oil prices, the effects on his economy uh, multiply. So that's point one. Point two, and this comes back to your original question, uh, it's extremely important for both withstanding additional Russian aggression and for Ukraine coming out in the right place for the government of President Poroshenko and Prime Minister Yatsenyuk to implement now serious reform. If they do that now, and it can be done despite the war, and the war even helps in the sense that most citizens in Ukraine understand that they have to sacrifice at this point in time. So if they can implement serious reform now, they consolidate their control, the, the Western-leaning agenda, the demo democratic open society agenda, in the vast majority of Ukraine that they, in fact, control. And it would make it harder, even if the Red Army were to push forward into Ukraine, for the Russians to hold on to that. So these are things that have to happen together. Thank you. So Strobe and Jan, and, and you can comment on anything you've heard, but let me add another question to this, uh, and then I'll go to the, uh, the, to the audience. Uh, if the United States, and both of you have been in senior positions in the State Department, the Pentagon, so you've dealt with alliance relations. Whenever you take a step like this, you have to think about impact on alliance. So if the U.S. Uh, adopts these recommendations about military aid, what do you think would be the uh, reaction in, the, uh, in NATO. Uh, will this be a test of unity of some sort? We've already seen a response today uh, from Chancellor Merkel 
not saying this shouldn't be done, but saying that Germany won't be the one to do it, if I read her, her, her comment correctly. But Strobe, first you and then Jen. I would not have expected uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, to have uh, either endorsed uh, the recommendations of this report or to have indicated that Germany would be prepared also to provide uh, lethal defensive aid. Uh, I think it is uh, important that what she has basically said stops exactly where you said. Uh, I would hope and I would expect, particularly in Chancellor Merkel's case, that uh, she would, as it were, say, we're standing back, but uh, leave unsaid what I would hope would be a recognition that somebody has got to help uh, the Ukrainians. And by the way, in general, uh, while there's been an awful lot of bad luck visited on the world of late, and particularly that part of the world, it is extremely good luck that uh, Angela Merkel uh, is where she is uh, today. Uh, there's an expression in, uh, in Germany, and I'm, pardon my German, uh, Putinverster or something like that. It means somebody who understands Putin, and it usually means in an, uh, uh, being an apologist for Putin. Uh, she is a real Putin understander, and I think that's why she has been <laughs> solid throughout. Thank, thank you for that. I, I will say that uh, we, we talked a lot about whether what we're recommending should be a recommendation for NATO to do something. Uh, some of us, myself included, had written earlier that NATO should take some action to help Ukraine as an alliance. And we did not say that. We said the United States should take the initial action. We think that some of the allies will come along very quickly. Uh, we've heard a lot from the polls about things that they think they could do. They even have some uh, uh, equipment from uh, the old uh, Soviet Union days that could be immediately useful to uh, uh, Ukraine and ammunition and things like that. Uh, and others uh, uh, will probably provide uh, some help uh, as well. But uh, it perhaps is fortunate that we don't have to go through the process of trying to get uh, a unanimous vote out of NATO to do anything that we've recommended. We have a new government in Greece. That's uncertain. Uh, they could slow things down. There's others in the alliance who might try to slow it down. But I don't think we'll see any significant overall objections uh, to what we're doing. And I'll make one other little brief comment about the interaction between economic aid to Ukraine and what we're talking about. We're not talking about much money here. We're talking about a billion dollars. You may have heard in the press that everybody's kind of agreed that they need at least 15 billion right away in economic aid to proceed ahead. Uh, and uh, George Soros has proposed a package that runs up to 50 billion uh, in economic aid. They're gonna have to buy some stuff themselves. Uh, so they're gonna have to have some money to spend uh, to operate, just to operate their forces as they are now and also to continue to uh, improve their situation. So the economic aid is closely tied to what we're suggesting. And if their economy collapses and they can't do anything at all, that's going to have a direct impact on their military ability on top of the impact on their economy. Thank you very much. Let me take some questions, please. And then uh, behind Harlan and then Harlan, let's uh, one after the other, please. Identify yourself and to whom you'd like to address the question. Thank you, uh, and thank you for this effort. Um, it's to all friends of Ukraine, it's, it's wonderful to be here today. Um, my question is uh, from the Russian perspective. When, you, when we sift out the propaganda and we sift out all the noise, they've made three conclusions from August, the airport, and today's operations. Number one, the Russians were stunned at the rate of ammunition expenditures. They didn't anticipate the logistical burdens of August, the airport, and today, which is why the train loads are coming in, et cetera. Second, they've noted that even controlling the separatists, they're able to iterate two and three times within the decision cycle of the Ukrainian military. And they have said that that, more than any specific weapon system, has given them the advantage in dictating events on the ground. So my question to the panel today is, if I think all of us here have a goal of either sending Cargo 200 back or raising the risk of Cargo 200 going back, shouldn't we be looking at general staff reform? Shouldn't we be looking at simplifying the chain of command between the volunteers, the National Guard, and the Ukrainian military? Shouldn't we be looking at, as 
I think Steve mentioned, excuse me, Ambassador had mentioned, um, command and control issues and equalizing the operational advantage of the Russians. A pa uh, some javelins on the, the tarmac of an airport will look great on YouTube and may change a tactical advantage. But if we can stand up the Ukrainian ability to even come close to the Russian operational cycle, won't that have the single greatest, excuse my French, force multiplier in equalizing circumstances on the ground? Thank you. Uh, th thank you. And who wants to deal with that question? I also wouldn't mind, uh, Strobe, if you could deal with a question that's connected to this that we really haven't talked about. And that is, this is ultimately about Russia, not necessarily Ukraine, although it's also about Ukraine. And, and um, uh, at the Atlantic Council, we have just been saying ad nauseum that we want a, a Europe whole and free in which Russia finds its peaceful place. The administration is going through a policy review right now. How does one tweak this? How, how does one di create a policy toward Russia? Uh, so first of all, maybe, uh, I don't know which of you wants to answer the question, but perhaps we can also then segue to a, to a larger question about how one guides one's overall policy toward Russia at the moment. You want to start on all that? Yeah. Um, we understand the importance of um, training for the Ukrainian military as part of this effort. And in fact, um, there's, a, there's a good program underway with Major General Key out of SACUR. And uh, we, we endorse that in our report. I would add to that, though, that part of the Ukrainian problem relates to both the intelligence they have as well as to their, their communications equipment. Because that's, that, those are, in the one case, very poor, in the other case, um, not very efficient, and they need help in those. With between the training, the intel, and commo equipment, uh, they can reduce this Russian advantage very quickly. Can I just two points very briefly? Uh, unfortunately, General Walt couldn't be with us. I mean, he, he's the one who's actually worn the uniform. And my impression was, I mean, and I think we all were, we were pretty impressed by what we saw at Kramatorsk. I mean, th there may be some broad problems, but at Kramatorsk, I think we felt we were meeting you know, the commander and a staff that was very professional, very understanding the problems that they had and the sorts of things they needed to uh, deal with those problems. The other point I want to make with just regards to the volunteer brigades is, is we do actually have a, 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 we do that address that in the report, a strong recommendation that the US government urge the Ukrainians to integrate those battalions into the mil regular military and the National Guard so they come under military discipline. Now, I don't think we think it's a particularly good idea for these sorts of private armies. And, and certainly from the military perspective, uh, you know, the coordination is not uh, what it could be. But your answer to the argument that the, uh, these weapons, as in previous situations where the US has sent weapons, will, not, will end, land in the wrong hands is? Uh, I, I, th I think our impression, you know, again from Kramatorsk, was that they would be taken care of in the appropriate way and that they would be used in an effective way. Well, with regard to the review of U.S. policy, which we hope will also be the Western communities and the international communities policy uh, towards Russia, I would hope that it would be, and I would expect that it would be, uh, sophisticated and uh, subtle in the following sense. This is not a time to try to drive Russia into isolation or to isolate uh, Russia. Uh, there, th this is not uh, Joseph Stalin's Russia, even though Putin may be the most powerful leader in the Kremlin since uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, the country that he rules uh, has come a long way. There are many uh, sectors uh, in Russian society and the Russian economy, and I would guess even in the, in the, uh, in the political elite, who I am certain in some cases uh, certain because of things that I have heard uh, in uh, sotto voce, I might say, uh, there is unease about where Putin is taking that country in two respects. One, what it will mean ultimately for Russia itself. Uh, this is an atavistic, uh, backward-looking po policy. It calls to mind uh, that a musty word from the 19th century, irredentism. It's, it's based on ethnicity. It's based on religious, uh, ethnic, and cultural affinity. And that is uh, not the basis for a multinational state like the Russian Federation. There are a lot of uh, citizens of the Russian Federation who are not Slavs. And I doubt they resonate uh, to the uh, Russian ethnic chauvinism of their leader right now. 
But the other thing is, there are a lot of Russians who have seen a great deal of the world. They have been globalized, and they will not uh, suffer, I think, for terribly long under a leadership that is trying to wall off Russia and pretend that it, can ha it has a Eurasian uh, option as opposed to adjoining the modern world. And I think that's such an important point, just a very different, uh, a very different Russia. Uh, so Harlan Ullman, I also want to say to all of you, Ivo Dalder, uh, very much part of this group, was uh, planning to be on his way from Chicago, but weather elements intervened. So uh, we, we forgive him. We hope, you, we hope you're uh, watching online. Please. Can I just uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Fred, your timing is not only immaculate, it's brilliant. Uh, it seems to me that sometime this week the administration is going to adopt some of your policies so you can say you guys took the lead and well done. Uh, having said that, and I agree entirely with your assessment of the tragedy in Ukraine, I'm far more agnostic and indeed skeptical about arming, not because Ukraine needs to be on equal footing, but I hear from your briefing very distant glimmerings to briefings 50 years ago about Vietnam. Now, I realize that Saigon is not Kiev, and Hanoi is not Moscow. But the consequences of what we might do or might not do, it seems to me, need to be much more furtherly, further examined. If I were Putin, and I think Putin ultimately is on the way out, I think he's got maybe three or four years. But if I were Putin, I would actually welcome a rearmament and armament as something to my best interest. First of all, I can use that for domestic propaganda. Second, I can use that to rally what I would want to do, which would be to form an independent duchy of East Ukraine. The one area militarily that I have a huge order of magnitude advantage is in theater and uh, short-range nuclear weapons. I would like to do a little bit of nuclear muscle flexing. And you see that's what he's doing with his bare aircraft. And I'd like to intimidate the Baltics and the uh, southern region more. So what prevents Putin from taking advantage of this? And as Fred, I think, quite rightly asked, escalating even more than he might not have had we not decided to go ahead and provide even minimal arms to Ukraine, who desperately needs them. Yeah, I, I think this is the, the, this is the, the fair question. And that, that we'll try to go through as many questions as possible. So maybe Jan, take this. Anyone else here wants to do a quick answer to it? Uh, but this is really the question that comes up also among my Polish friends, which is, which is uh, you have to do, you, when you go in this path, then you have to deter and, and, and make sure that you don't just provoke without deterring. So what's, what is your, Jim, maybe you pick it up first and then others on the panel as well. Well, one can't predict these futures. Obviously, there's some risk. We see a tremendous risk at doing nothing because what we see happens if we do nothing is that he pushes ahead. He probably opens his corridor, perhaps even from Mariupol to Crimea. Crimea is very difficult for him to maintain without a corridor there. He's pushing toward his Nova Russia. Uh, goal that he says. Once he does that, all bets are off for a Europe whole and free for our whole strategy for uh, everything that we've tried to do. And we may or may not be in a full-scale Cold War, but we're in a very different world. Steve Hadley sat in this chair just a few days ago and argued that he thought we already were in a very different world. And uh, it could be that that's, that that's the case. So, and I think the uh, Vietnam analogy is very, very weak. Uh, it just isn't the same situation really quite at all. Uh, and I won't uh, elaborate, uh, elaborate that here except to just, uh, just assert that. So uh, I think when you think carefully about what the alternatives are here, that to leave the Ukrainians completely unsupported here in a military sense, uh, although we're trying to support very strongly through the sanctions and the other things which are very important. The other thing is, if Putin does these things, there will be worse sanctions. There will be more problems for Ukraine. There will be more problems for his government. And uh, these, are not, uh, these are not things that we had as tools available to us in the Vietnam era. So we have a lot more tools now than we used to have. Uh, I think that we need to understand the problem. And the problem is not Putin's Ukraine policy. The, the, the problem is Putin's broader vision of revision throughout Eurasia. Now, we can decide right now that it is not in our strategic interest to let Putin have his way in Ukraine, in Georgia, in Kazakhstan, which he also threatened back in August. And for that matter, in the Baltic states, which means we'd have to be willing to give up Article 5 as a serious deterrent, because Putin's objectives appear to include the Baltic states. So here's what we need to do. We need to give Ukraine the arms so we raise the price of Putin's aggression in Ukraine. 
At the same time, and Strobe mentioned this, we need to have a very serious deterrent policy in the Baltic states and in Poland. What we did in Wales was completely inadequate. The alliance um, labeled ISIS a strategic threat, an existential threat, and said nothing comparable about the world's greatest nuclear, or one of the two greatest nuclear powers in the world. We need to put serious forces into the Baltic states as a deterrent there, as we give Ukraine the ability to fight Russians on the ground. In that case, if you do that, you keep the sanctions on, the economic problems in Russia grow greater, Russian casualties going back home grow greater, and Putin cannot explain to the Russian people why Russian soldiers are fighting in Ukraine, which is why he's lying to them. Decisive action across these specters makes sure that we can stop him before we have a problem in the Baltic states. I might just add very just briefly that uh, polls have consistently shown that although a large number of Russians support Putin's policy in general towards Ukraine, those polls also show that only a very small number favor actually having the Russian army fighting in Ukraine. And, and that's why I think the uh, Russian government has gone through extraordinary lengths and I think disgraceful lengths over the last six, five months to hide from the Russian people that the uh, Russian army is in the Donbass. And those who respond to those polls are not exactly getting a broad spectrum of information. <laughs> Probably true, yes. <laughs> Please, here. I'm Basil Scarless. I used to work at the State Department on economic issues. And one issue that you seem to have raised is the problem posed by countries like Greece who, who seem to line up with the Russians. And I'd like to ask your opinion, will that be an obstacle on extension of the sanctions or additional sanctions later on in the European Union and perhaps even to some sort of NATO action in the Baltics? Which of you would like to address that? Strobe, maybe. And, and, and we have a situation, uh, I wouldn't say just Greece, but an uh, issue of potential divisions in Europe where the Obama administration, I think, rightly says one of its, uh, one of its achievements thus far is actually keeping Europe and the U.S. together. Uh, I think Greece uh, is uh, sufficiently burdened with its own problems that it's not going to uh, uh, become an obstacle on something that doesn't bear directly on those problems. Ambassador. Thank you for a great report. I have a, one question. Uh, you already elaborated that, you know, if it comes to Ukraine, we have to give them weapon and training. If it comes to Baltic countries, then it's uh, Article 5. What about Georgia? What about Azerbaijan? What about Kazakhstan? What should be a U.S. policy uh, in those areas where Russia may decide to act beside Ukraine? because I can hardly imagine Putin getting quiet in, if Ukrainians will show him a bloody nose. Yeah, that's one of the things that's really come home to us at the Atlantic Council is that uh, there really isn't a NATO policy for what one would call the gray zone, non-NATO members and, 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 and uh, non-NATO members and Russian neighbors. Yeah. Uh, Tamari, let me take a crack at it. Uh, it I, I think the the broad answer is that the United States should support the citizens and the leaders of those peri states peripheral to the Russian Federation who are determined to maintain uh, their sovereignty, uh, President uh, Nazarbayev uh, being, uh, uh, being, being one. Uh, and uh, as for Georgia, uh, it's of course, as you know so well, uh, having uh, among other things uh, negotiated with, uh, with the Russians and with the breakaway uh, enclaves uh, in Georgia. Russia is deliberately salting the earth uh, around its borders with so-called frozen conflicts. I wouldn't describe what's going on in Ukraine as exactly frozen, uh, nor would I describe uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, as a frozen conflict. People are, are dying. But it's a classic case of what um, good old Uncle Joe Stalin did in his first job uh, in the uh, Bolshevik government, which was uh, People's Commissar of Nationalities, and that was to make sure, uh, even though each of these uh, republics of the USSR had an ethnically based name, that they also had a conflict within them so Moscow could play that game, and here they are doing it again. And it's going to backfire because the, the kinds of uh, conflicts that can arise from diverse uh, ethnic communities within a state exist in Russian, Russia itself. The word uh, Islam has not come up in this conversation. 
uh, a significant portion of the Russian Federation's population is at least culturally and historically in terms of their names um, have uh, Muslim pasts. Uh, and the, uh, the increase in chauvinism, Russian chauvinism out of Moscow is creating an opportunity for wild and crazy guys in turbans uh, in, you know, in Afghanistan and places like that uh, to be uh, already escalating uh, the, uh, not just the threat, but the actuality of extremist Islam inside of Russia. So that's yet another way in which uh, this great, supposed great strategist, uh, Vladimir Putin, is doing something that is strategically very, very dangerous to his own country. The one thing also in answer to your question is uh, Steve Hadley on this stage a couple of days ago, former National Security Advisor, was talking about how uh, uh, one, can, one cannot allow, continue to allow frozen conflicts to stop a forward movement in relations with the, uh, the European Union or NATO with given countries because that just incentivizes those who create the f frozen conflicts. But um, please. Identify yourself and to whom you'd Thank like you. Thank you. My name is uh, Igor Dunayevsky. I'm a reporter for a Russian newspaper. Uh, I would like to follow up on uh, the question. Uh, uh, my question is to Ambassador Pfeiffer. Uh, yeah. You are referring to polls showing that uh, Russians uh, don't support uh, uh, the Russian forces uh, fighting in Ukraine. So uh, my question is, uh, don't you think that uh, sending uh, uh, defensive uh, little assistance to Ukraine uh, can change that and uh, kind of create a sense of threat in uh, Russia uh, from West, uh, mobilize uh, Russian society and the West uh, to assume those uh, higher costs. And uh, in this case, if that happens and uh, if a conflict escalates, uh, which I don't think is entirely impossible, uh, would you mm, at some point be ready <coughs> to recommend uh, uh, US government to mm, have boots on the ground in Ukraine? Oh, asking bluntly, do you think the, the West should be ready to go to war over Ukraine if Russia is ready and rebels are ready to accept those costs? Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you for your question. And that's uh, a couple, I guess, make three points. Uh, first of all, um, I'm not sure that the arrival of American military assistance yeah. is a tool that the Russian government can use in its propaganda campaign aimed at the Russian public. I mean, they've already so vilified the United States now when you watch what's going on in the Russian media, it's hard to believe they could do much more. Yeah. Second, I, I, again, I, there may be an escalation risk, but as I think we've all said, over the last 10 months, Russia has escalated and escalated and escalated. And, and the question now is, can we give the Ukrainians the tools to deter further escalation? Uh, and the third point, again, would be looking at defensive arms, that sort of capability. Uh, at, at some point, I, I think the Russian government, you know, is that going to cause the Russians to put more troops there? Well, you know. By NATO count, there's already now at least 200 troops there. The Ukrainian number is more like 8,000. Uh, there was no dispute between NATO and Ukraine that in August and September, you had organized units, Russian airborne and Russian mechanized infantry units, fighting in eastern Ukraine. Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to see how you know Russia can do that much more. Thank you. Please. Thank you, gentlemen, for your uh, work for Ukraine from my country. I'm Nikolai Vorobyov. I'm a Ukrainian journalist. I've spent totally two months in battle zone in, in uh, fall and in June. So I were, it was in the Baltseva near Donetsk airport and all around. So um, thank you again. And I have my questions not, not for me, but from my friends in the battle zone right now. So they are asking you about a time. I mean, they needed, they needed the weapon. Even in summer, when I was there, so most of the weapon, and I can show you on my cell, they used it from captured Russians or pro-Russian separatists. So it was Russian weapon, machine guns, Kalashnikov and everything. And there are a lot of clear evidences. So they needed it like even a year ago. So the question is about the time. And the next question is about like, uh, 
what are your sources of information? Because to, according, to my, uh, according to my experience, usually the prospects from Kiev and from battle zone, it's something different. So Kiev may ask you for something like come under control, but people on the ground, they don't need some long-term uh, equipment. They need something right now and just get, give it for us like today and we can use it tomorrow or something like this. So uh, are you aware that this is like a different prospects like from diff in Kyiv and in battle zone? And the third question is about the refugees. Uh, do you have any strategies? Because we have around one million displaced people in Ukraine and who are like left the country. So three, uh, three uh, short questions about the prospects from Kyiv and battle zone. The second about the time, just simple when and the third about refugees. Thank you very much. Who would like to ha handle it? Well, I, could, I could talk about the second question. I mean, I think one thing that our team noticed was that in terms of the Ukrainian military needs, uh, there was no difference between what we heard in Kyiv and what we heard at the frontal headquarters in Kramatorsk. I mean, you know, the, the, the recommendations that we've made there for both non-lethal assistance and also for light anti-tank weapons were very much articulated in very clear terms and almost identical terms, both in Kyiv and Kramatorsk. Regarding timing, I mean, Steve and I have been arguing for we defensive weapons for Ukraine since last May. We agree with you. The weapons should have been delivered a long time ago. Um, unfortunately, things in Washington sometimes work slowly. And we hope our report will energize the debate within the administration, as well as energize Congress to further action. Um, I am optimistic, but my optimism says it'll probably take months for the decision to be made and any weapons to arrive. But um, we'll, we'll have to see. And on refugees, this is a very difficult problem. I know that USAID has been in Ukraine, done some, some good work, at least surveying this, the, 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 the extent of the problem. But I know more work needs to be done. And I'm afraid I don't have much more to add than that. Thank I you. Just to add uh, uh, briefly uh, that. Uh, uh, you know, the United States actually does have an assistance program to Ukraine underway with uh, non-lethal uh, equipment and support of various kinds. I think it adds up to about $70 million, in fact. Uh, and uh, there's a study underway on how to implement the uh, 100, and so, 100 plus million dollars that were authorized. So there's some thinking uh, that's been done there. So probably some of these things, particularly the non-lethal parts, can move fairly quickly. Uh, we recommended some kind of light uh, anti-armor capabilities and so forth. That might take longer. Uh, as we said, we have strongly suggested that they be provided out of existing stocks, which means they could move fairly quickly. But you're not going to impact this present battle uh, with that. We understand that, and there's no easy way around that. If, in fact, the United States announcing that it's prepared to offer this kind of assistance, uh, opens up the opportunity for some of the other uh, NATO allies to provide uh, assistance from their stocks. Some of that could come very quickly, and a lot of that is compatible with their present uh, equipment and could be useful to them uh, uh, almost uh, within a matter of uh, days or weeks. Thank you, Jim. Can I, can I just want to yes, point? please. And that is that we hope this sense of urgency is felt not just in the administration but also in Congress. And I would say that the Ukraine Freedom Support Act that was uh, voted by a very large majority in, Dece in December of last year, that was a very positive step. Uh, but uh, I think we would agree uh, that the amount of money uh, that it suggested for Ukraine was too little, and it only authorized, it didn't appropriate any money. Uh, so I think Congress has to get engaged here in a very urgent way and not just authorize money, but also uh, appropriate it. Thank, thank you very much. Here, and then I think we'll start going toward the back, maybe even way in the back and then here, but please. Okay. Stephen Blank, American Foreign Policy Council. I'm struck by the fact that although you mentioned military assistance to Ukraine, economic assistance, and obviously alliance cohesion, the defense of the Baltics, nobody has said anything about the need to counter the information warfare that Russia is carrying okay. out not only here in the United States, but in Europe and at home, in order to bring home to the Russian population what's going on and until we do that, we really have not undermined what is critical to Putin, that is domestic support, because we've not broken his information barrier. Uh, that's a very good point. We haven't mentioned it yet, so uh, maybe one, uh, one of you or a couple of you can answer that. Also, whether you've been surprised by how sophisticated uh, the information warfare has been. 
Well, yeah, seemingly. Uh, yeah. and no, certainly, I, I, well, first of all, I mean, the information war aspect was a little bit beyond the scope. We were going there specifically to look at mm -hmm. the military situation in eastern Ukraine and also what are the Ukrainians' immediate defense needs. But, but no, I, I would completely agree, Steve. I think we need to be more effective in terms of the information war. Uh, I think, I just for your point, I mean, I, I think the Russians are doing a lot. Uh, a lot of those not horribly sophisticated. I mean, it, it, it's actually sort of stunning how little they seem to care about this. And I'll, I'll bring out an example. About two months ago, Russian television said, aha, we have solved the mystery <coughs> of who shot down Malaysian Air 17. Uh, surprise, surprise, the Russians said it was a Ukrainian fighter. And they based it on this satellite picture, they said, where it showed the Malaysian airliner and it showed this jet about three miles away or whatever. Uh, and it took the uh, social media guys about 15 minutes to pick this thing apart saying, well, yeah, if you look at the Boeing jet, in fact, the logo's in the wrong place. It's not a Malaysian airliner. If you look at the fighter, uh, the fighter, it's first of all, it's coming from the wrong direction, given where the jet was hit. And it's not the Su-25 that the Russians have been saying since last July that shot it down. It's a totally different type of airplane. And then somebody a lot smarter about these mathematical calculations than I said, well, if you take this, if you assume that this was taken from a satellite about 200 kilometers up, and you do the math, that airplane's actually about three kilometers long. <laughs> so there, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there, but a lot of it's pretty, pretty uh, bad. And I, I think it's, it, it's not designed so much to um, portray an alternative narrative as just, just to throw so much dust and, and smoke up there as to cause confusion. Uh, and, and, and there's got to be an information war that calculates precisely that. I'd like to add two points to that. The first is, um, Fred, I agree with you that the packaging has been sophisticated, slick. But Steve's right that the message has often been r rather um, weak. But as long as they keep pumping out quantity and they can maintain a monopoly on their own information space, it's reasonably effective. But there's a second point which comes back to Steve's question. And I also agree with the premise of that question. We're devoting very little in the way of resources to the information war. And that's something the administration should be taking a very serious look at. Thank you. Way in the back, please. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to get to you as I see you, and I'm sorry if I, if I don't have an exact order. Uh. Thank you. Leandra Bernstein, Sputnik International, International News. Uh, question for the panel. I'd like to really split hairs on this uh, boots on the ground concept. We, the United States is providing some military training to uh, the Ukrainian military. And from my understanding, uh, the report calls for additional training, or is that just the Ukraine Freedom Support Act calling for additional training? So where will that training be taking place? And will it be in Ukraine? Will it be in the United States? And if it is in Ukraine, will there be American NATO boots on the ground training Ukrainians? And just secondly, I. I would appreciate a little bit of a forecast, if you could, about Kerry's upcoming visit. Well, uh, Don't all jump up at <laughs> once. Uh, uh, I, I will be happy to say, I think that what we envisioned was most of the training we're calling for is training that's directly related to the additional items that we are suggesting be supplied. And we didn't go back and look at the, the training that is already underway. We did hear a short briefing on that while we were at uh, SHAPE headquarters um, and did meet the, the, uh, uh, the senior officer who's responsible for all of those programs. There, there, there's quite a bit of American effort underway, uh, some of it uh, from uh, NATO and some of it uh, from, uh, uh, from the embassy in, uh, in Ukraine. To, uh, uh, to do some things like that. So there's an infrastructure there that ought to allow the kind of training that we're talking about, which would be additional, to be stepped up. And there are Americans in Ukraine today doing that. And yes, Americans would have to be in Ukraine to do this additional training. I don't know in detail whether it would be possible to bring some Ukrainian uh, uh, officers, officials uh, uh, to the United States. I think we sort of, at least I sort of presumed that it would probably mostly uh, 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 happen there. I would add one caveat as well. Um, often the phrase boots on the ground means soldiers who are in the fighting zone if not actually fighting. And that's not what's being contemplated as far as we know. And for that matter, we're not, we're not necessarily recommending that either. Um, as for what Secretary Kerry is going to do, um, 
although I'm no longer a diplomat, you have to be careful about what you predict. I suspect he'll go with a lot of sympathy. I'm not certain he'll go with a lot of packages. But normally when a Secretary of State travels, he brings at least something, or she brings at least something. I would just say that, there are, that the plans, as I understand it, for training of the, I think it's four um, battalions of the Ukrainian National Guard, that training will take place at Yavari, which is in far western Ukraine, almost on the Polish border, uh, well away from the uh, conflict zone. And, and moreover, I, I think we did recognize this, this point is that uh, in the report we did say that the equipment that should be provided to the Ukrainians, they should be capable of operating it and maintaining the field without having American personnel there. So we, we did draw a line there. Thank you very much. Uh, up here, I'm, thank you for being so patient. Please. Hmm. Uh, Stefano Stefani, the Atlantic Council. A very quick question. On the short term, uh, I'm based in Brussels in, in my current life, more on the EU side than on the, on the NATO side. And in the, in the EU environment, all the debate is about sanctions and about, as you said, the renewal of uh, the sectoral sanctions that are due in uh, in July, uh, do you see Putin going for more offensive, and with that he will foreclose any chance of having uh, an easing or not renew the sanctions, or some apparently conciliatory gesture and trying to influence uh, the debate on sanctions? Because in the short term, you say between now and June is either one or the other. There, are, there aren't many. Uh, many way to finesse a way in between, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I think we, we heard probably three scenarios for separatist and Russian military actions. The first scenario, which I would argue is in play now, and that is basically consolidating the line of contact. So they, they, there was the attacks on the Donetsk airport two weeks ago. There's now this very active attack that's going on on the salient around Debaltseva. And uh, I mean, one of the things, that if you look at a map starting September 5, where the line of contact was, and then look at how that line has moved, uh, the separatists of the Russians have occupied in excess of 500 square kilometers be beyond what they had in September. So, so basically, that kind of consolidation uh, would be scenario one. But there were other scenarios, you know, maybe less likely, but I think still the Ukrainians are thinking about them. Scenario two would be to take uh, Mr. Zaharchenko, the so-called leader of the uh, so-called People's Republic of Donetsk, who says he wants to take all of Donetsk. And, and all of Luhansk. So that's the second scenario. And then the third scenario, which has been uh, up there, but I think was probably in terms of what we heard in Ukraine, you know, would rank third in terms of the scenarios, was that there might be a, a Russian push all the way to create the land bridge uh, to a Crimea. And, and, and again, I mean, I don't think there was any doubt in that, that the Russian military could do that. Uh, the question would be then, you know, how would they garrison it? Because we, we did hear from several points that uh, there are active plans for a partisan conflict, conflict if there is a major Russian advance to the West. Regarding sanctions, uh, again, the, the most important sanctions come up um, in September and for Europe. And uh, I think Mr. Putin is hoping he'd be able to persuade the Europeans not to renew them. Because when you renew sanctions, you, everyone has to vote for them again. You need unanimity. On the other hand, and um, I heard this in Brussels uh, on my last trip, that in EU practice, there's a condition given for laying down sanctions. And if that condition is not satisfied, the sanctions have always been renewed. And I think that precedent, plus the fact that Mr. Putin continues to escalate in Ukraine, increases the odds that the sanctions will, in fact, be renewed. And that's why, for me, next September may be the critical date this year in the crisis. If the sanctions are renewed, uh, aggression, Russian aggression in Ukraine is under serious threat, which is a good thing. Some sanctions came in July, others were in, in September. Please. But you're right, July is also important. Here and then across. Yep. Okay. Um, Andre Larion of Cato Institute. Two questions. First, uh, there is a serious debate going on, maybe in slightly indirect way, about the military versus non-military solution to this war. Uh, there is a line goes on that there is no military solution. Uh, but your report seems to suggest that there should be military assistance to Ukraine. And certainly a lot of debate goes about the yeah. fight. So what would be your stance whether there is, there is no military solution to this war or there is no 
non-military solution. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand to Jan Lodel, but um, uh, if you read the last paragraph in the executive summary, um, I, I want to make something very clear. The, the Atlantic Council in general, a, a, any one of our reports doesn't speak for the entirety of the Atlantic Council. The Atlantic Council has many points of view. This is, this is a report from this a very, very important group that, that has gone out and gathered this information and come to these conclusions. We, uh, uh, no one is celebrating the situation that we're in with Russia. We know that uh, a stable and secure uh, Europe requires uh, Russia's being a peaceful uh, part of it. Um, the, the, but the paragraph reads, assisting Ukraine to deter attack and defend itself is not inconsistent with the search for a peaceful political solution. It is essential to achieving it. Only if the Kremlin knows that the risks and costs of further military action are high will it seek to find an acceptable political solution. So I think that answers your question, but Jenna, you may want to. Uh, um, I was going to do essentially the same thing, yeah. read that paragraph. Uh, I think we believe there is no military solution. The only military outcome that could, if you just keep fighting forever and, and you put everything into it, the Russians win. We've said that. Ukraine cannot withstand the entire Russian army. No question about that. Now, if Russia wants to conquer all of Ukraine and put itself in that geopolitical position of having done that, with all of the consequences that will mean for Russia, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very, very tough, tough thing for them to do. Uh, they do seem to want to uh, do the things that we have uh, uh, described here that, that stop short of that, but nonetheless, uh, like they did in Georgia, split the country up uh, into pieces, uh, allow them to occupy parts of it. They have annexed part of it, a significant part of it in terms of Crimea, violated all these rules and so forth. And so what we're trying to do is to deter that further action uh, because it's clear that without some kind of military response, the Russians don't stop. Look at what happened here in the last few weeks, a couple of weeks. There was no provocation to Russia to uh, undertake this uh, latest, uh, latest action. Uh, it's a strictly offensive action to uh, add to the territory that uh, uh, the separatists and the Russians on the ground are controlling. The, the, the last question, the small one. What is the, your recommendation to the US uh, administration for the final long-term goal uh, in this war? End of hostilities? Uh, withdrawal of Russian troops from the continental Ukraine or restoring uh, of territorial integrity of Ukraine on the full territory, including Crimea? I think, our, I think our goal with what we have recommended here is the end of hostilities and the withdrawal of Russian, uh, uh, Russian troops. Uh, we have not really addressed the question of Crimea except to say that uh, it must be restored to Ukraine's sovereignty. Uh, but we haven't uh, addressed that in terms of mechanisms to get that done. We think it will be in Russia's interest to do that, to uh, reverse that uh, decision on their part uh, over time. And uh, we believe that if the rest of Ukraine proceeds uh, in a path of development and a path of reform that we think is quite possible, that uh, those political circumstances can occur. Uh, I think uh, I can pretty much speak for all of us that you know, we look to a strategy in Europe which really is what the United States has stood for since the end of the Cold War, a Europe whole and free with Russia finding its own place in that Europe uh, and uh, being an integral part of this Europe whole and free. And that's what we want to have happen. Uh, uh, all of us want Russia to be inside this uh, 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 wonderful, developing, and uh, uh, vibrant community, not outside it. The, uh, if I just yeah, second please. that, Jan's part, yeah, yeah. Uh, and say that some of you, I probably spent about half of my career working on better relations between Washington and Moscow. Uh, but, I, but I think in order to, to fit there, uh, Russia has to play by the rules that the rest of Europe is playing by. They, they can't write their own rules, and they can't define for Russia this right to uh, take territory from neighbors when they see fit. Um, just one last point on the question of uh, eastern Ukraine versus Crimea. Uh, this report focuses on eastern Ukraine, but in that case, I think we really took the lead from the Ukrainian government, which I think has made the correct decision to say now the immediate focus, the most urgent issue, is eastern Ukraine. 
And Crimea has to be addressed, but that's a longer term problem. And let me just add that a month from now, the Atlantic Council is going to have an event on presenting a report on the human rights situation in Crimea. So stay tuned. Yeah, I, I, the, the, uh, anyway, just sort of uh, cascading down, you have an international law issue, you have a European border issue, you have a Russia issue, you have a Ukraine issue. So, so as we look at this as the, as, the, as, as the Atlantic Council, we have concerns at all those levels. Please. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Mankoff with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I know the focus of the report is on the military side, but since you mentioned that the goal of providing military assistance is to move closer to a diplomatic solution, I was wondering um, if you'd given thought in the report or if you had thoughts more generally about what that solution would ultimately look like. Because of course, if defensive weaponry is what's being provided to the Ukrainian military, then presumably that can stop additional, or raise the cost at least of additional Russian um, aggression. But it's not going to change the facts on the ground in terms of the areas in eastern Ukraine that are already under Russian or separatist control. So when you're thinking about what a negotiated end to the conflict would look like, what would you propose doing um, about those areas that are essentially under military occupation and that no amount of defensive um, military assistance is going to allow the Ukrainian military to take back? The, uh, I, I, I apologize if I wasn't quite so clear on that. I think I said in answer to the previous question that uh, our, uh, I think, uh, uh, objective here for uh, a resolution is withdrawal of all Russian troops from that area and returning that area to Ukrainian sovereignty. Ukrainian uh, themselves, the government has made clear that they're prepared to countenance a variety of special arrangements for that uh, area to ensure that uh, there is some reasonable degree of autonomy there. But the border needs to be back where it was before it was uh, overtaken by Russian forces uh, invading. And by the way, we haven't talked about it, but they continue this invasion through this unbelievable outrage of these white, supposedly humanitarian uh, convoys coming in. So this invasion continues in many ways, uh, even violating uh, normal, uh, Judy Miller could tell me, but normal rules of, of uh, laws of warfare of, uh, of marking things as humanitarian when in fact uh, they've got tanks and armored personnel carriers and weapons galore inside them. And also they're refusing to let the OSCE uh, 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 look at them. So all of that has to stop. The borders have to be where they are. Uh, Ukraine has to have control of that border. Russia has to close that border. And their troops have to be uh, taken out of there uh, is where we would see that, uh, where we would see a reasonable uh, solution. Th those are all, by the way, points that Russia agreed to in, in the September 5 ceasefire agreement in Minsk. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, the, Am the Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, good to have you with us, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the report, which is uh, very professional and which reflects accurately the situation in Ukraine in general and the situation on the ground. Uh, we really highly appreciate in Ukraine the assistance provided by United States and strong support in the European Union uh, for Ukraine, and we also highly appreciate the leading role uh, the, of the United States in uh, international efforts to, to help to my country in this very difficult time of uh, Ukrainian uh, history. Uh, but yes, we need uh, additional assistance. Uh, this uh, war is not only against Ukraine. This war is against uh, Europe and international order and international, uh, 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 um, uh, international law, I would say. And uh, that's <laughs> Why we hope that, as Ambassador Herbst uh, said, that uh, this report will energize administration and Congress for more actions. Uh, we uh, consider in Ukraine that uh, Russian aggression should be stopped today, now, because uh, every day uh, makes the situation much more difficult. As, as, uh, as I said, this is only, not only against Ukraine, and yes, that's true that uh, Moldova, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Baltic states uh, uh, feel today not very comfortable, as, uh, uh, as well as uh, some other states which are neighbors of 
of uh, Russia. And uh, what we need, we need uh, as well to uh, uh, strengthen their efforts uh, in sanctions regime as well, and we stand for further sanctions. Uh, Minsk agreements, uh, Minsk accords, uh, as you know very well, uh, are ignored by uh, Moscow. Uh, they are ignored also by those separatists. And uh, the main demand of the uh, Minsk Accords, namely to withdraw all uh, Russian military troops from, from Ukraine, weaponry from Ukraine, and to seal the border for uh, those uh, mercenaries and, and uh, uh, well, militants. Uh, also, uh, these provisions are ignored. So we, uh, uh, we, we consider that uh, it's not the time to talk about the uh, possibility of, of uh, removing sanctions, but on the contrary, on, on increasing sanction uh, regime. Uh, and uh, yes, the territorial integrity of Ukraine should be restored. And uh, uh, otherwise, uh, it uh, uh, will send a very wrong signal to the world that uh, bigger countries can change uh, borders by uh, force and uh, uh, the, the, this can be accepted by international community. This is not the case. And uh, once again, I would like to mention Budapest Memorandum that the uh, uh, Russian aggression un undermines the non-proliferation regime. And this is again the task for international community to restore this trust in a uh, non-proliferation regime. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that important statement. Uh, this, as you said, quote, this war is not only against Ukraine, this is also about Europe and about international law. We, we, we th and I think I'll close there, but go back to the panel. I'm sorry we have more than a dozen other questions. I just couldn't get to anyone. At the end of the executive sum summary, it says two sentences, and maybe for each of you, um, perhaps I could close with this and then ask you your response very briefly. So Russians' actions in and against Ukraine pose a gravest threat to European security in more than 30 years. The West has the capacity to stop Russia. The question is whether it has the will. Um, that's a pretty big question because ultimately that's what deterrence, deterrence isn't just about uh, what you have in terms of resources is what your will is. I wonder if each of you could address that, uh, both looking at the United States and looking at, uh, at our European allies. And, 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 and because that is really what, what's going to be needed for the successful implementation of what you're, what you're asking for. And maybe we'll go uh, from Steve to John to Jen. Okay, well, um, no, I, I think that, that is a very big question. Um, uh, we briefed the report uh, at senior levels of the US government last week. Uh, I think we heard a couple of things. Uh, one, uh, that we were told the report was very timely. Uh, second, uh, we heard that this is very much a live issue within the US government now, uh, perhaps more so than it was in the fall. Uh, and so uh, I, I think our hope is that, uh, in fact, the US government is now going to begin to show the will and begin to take these steps and move forward on greater military assistance to Ukraine. I think another question is whether the West understands the problem. Uh, Steve and I have been working this for a long time. And I would say back in the spring, very few people, even in Washington, understood it. I think today a much larger number of people understand this is a problem of Kremlin revisionism, not of communal problems within Ukraine. And I think gradually, gradually, the West is waking up with, with, with the exception of the Eastern Europe, our Eastern European allies, the United States in the lead. And I think Congress is, 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 quick, is quick coming along. And I think the administration, not as quick, but it is also moving in the right direction. And once we understand the problem correctly, the will will be there. But it may take us a few more months. Yeah. Well, I associate myself with my colleagues. Uh, I would add that uh, I have some sympathy for the difficulty the United States faces here, because the United States is uh, taking the lead uh, in the crucial fight against ISIL. Uh, the United States is taking the lead in a variety of other places uh, around the world. And uh, it's difficult. Uh, we have our own challenges here. We have our own politics here. Uh, so we need the help of all of our allies. We're getting the strong support of our allies. The sanctions 
regime is really quite amazing when you think about it, uh, that this has uh, come, come about as quickly and as strongly as it has. Uh, we don't believe that what we're suggesting here is a major increase in exercise of will. Uh, it's a change in kind to say defensive uh, lethal weapons as opposed to the other kinds of support that we're providing. Uh, we think that it could have a big multiplier effect. It could help tremendously uh, in deterrence. But uh, I'm, I'm encouraged, given what happened uh, on sanctions, given how unified uh, NATO and the, much of the rest of the world have been uh, in, in this regard. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the major powers all see that uh, a Russia behaving this way and left unchecked uh, leads to a very unstable world. They still have 15 or 20,000 active nuclear weapons. Uh, they don't seem to be interested at all in reducing their huge stockpile of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, that was promised uh, when uh, President George H.W. Bush uh, agreed to eliminate American tactical nuclear weapons and did so unilaterally, uh, but without the reciprocity that was. So there's been a very, very difficult situation there. And that has to make one concerned about Russia's policy to begin with, all apart from Ukraine. And when you add these kind of things onto it, I think it shows the rest of the world that we all have a mutual policy and all, uh, I mean, a mutual challenge. And I think that uh, uh, taken together, uh, that will generate the will. Um, thank, thank you so much, Jen. Let me just close by um, saying that the authors of this report are serious individuals and they are not saber rattlers. These are people who have uh, served the United States in very important capacities and have done that as very moderate individuals who only come together around this kind of a report when they see something um, of uh, historic significance where by not answering it we could turn out worse. worse. Uh, we knew this would be a controversial report. We hope that it will uh, excite the kind of debate that it should excite of whether we have other good alternatives. Uh, I, I would only say that uh, Vladimir Putin could sa change the sanctions regime and, and, uh, and de-escalate uh, you know, tomorrow. Uh, so uh, so it's, really, it's really in his hands more than anyone else's hands. Uh, I, think I, I think we were all moved by Strobe Talbot's opening comments. Uh, uh, saying that we shouldn't mix words any longer, that this is an act of war, not a proxy war, a literal invasion, not a virtual one, and a virtual annexation, and that it is a th threat to the uh, peace of Europe and beyond. Uh, it's hard to argue with any of that. Those are the facts. How one handles it uh, and how one comes to terms with this, uh, I, think, uh, I think serious people will disagree. But I thank you all for coming here. Uh, I hope that we're on the path to a peaceful resolution of the situation in Ukraine. Certainly, uh, as we call uh, in this report, as the authors call in this report for defensive weapons, it isn't uh, in order to cause military escalation, but it's really to encourage a diplomatic solution more quickly than might otherwise be the case. Thank you all for coming.